Hello and welcome. Today, we're going to talk about a serial communication technology that's low power, permits multi-drop communications, device discovery, and requires just one wire plus ground and no separate power supply connection. Impossible, you say? <laughs> Nonsense! Maxim has been doing this for years and we call it the one wire interface. Hey, buckle in and I'll tell you how it works. A one wire device has, well, just one wire plus ground. That one wire connects to an open drain bus, which means any device on the bus can pull the voltage on the bus toward ground, but no device can drive the bus high. Every one wire bus includes a passive pull up resistor. Now, the value of this pull up resistor may range from a little more than 100 ohms to a few thousand ohms, depending on the kind and the number of devices on the bus. A one wire device transmits and receives data over that single wire and it derives all of the operating power it needs over the same wire. How it does this is kind of an interesting story. Let's start by popping off the lid and taking a look inside. Since a one wire bus is open drain, there's a FET switch on the IO line to pull the open drain bus down when it's time to send data. And there's a buffer to square up the signals from the IO line. For power, we include a rectifier and a small internal capacitor. We call this parasite power, and it's how we can run the internal logic of the one wire device even when another citizen on the net is pulling the I.O. line low. Now, Because we expect one wire devices will often be used in harsh environments, every one wire device includes ESD protection. Depending on the intended use, one wire devices may support an 8 kilovolt discharge using the human body model and some devices are capable of withstanding a 15 kilovolt air discharge. The sequence of bits coming from the host is presented to an interface and control block. Now this block is present in every one wire device and it serves as a kind of bridge between the bus itself and whatever practical device functionality there might be on the back end. And there's one more thing to talk about and it sets the one wire system apart from all the other serial interface schemes. The interface and control block includes a 64-bit identifier that's unique to every one-wire device. No two one-wire devices contain the same identifier, and I'll show you why that's useful in just a moment. Transferring data is simple. Every bit is initiated by the host, whether sent from the host to the one-wire device or received from the one-wire device by the host. Now, at the standard speed, data can be transmitted at up to 15.4 kilobits per second, giving a bit period of about 65 microseconds. Now, it's okay to send data more slowly, as long as you mind the bit times. There's also an overdrive speed of 125 kilobits per second, but today we're going to focus on that standard speed. To send a 1-bit, the host pulls down the I.O. line and holds it low for between 1 and 15 microseconds, and then releases it for the rest of the 65 microsecond bit period. To send a 0-bit, the host pulls down the I.O. line for between 60 and 120 microseconds and then releases it, and then it leaves the line high for at least 5 microseconds. This high time is critical. It demarcates bit periods, yes, but it also lets that parasite power capacitor in the one wire device charge up between bits. Okay, over in the one wire device, the falling edge of the IO line starts a timer. Then a few microseconds later, the one wire device samples the line. I mean, what could be simpler? Now, when the host wants to read something from the one wire device, well, that's where things get a little tricky. Uh, to read a bit from a one wire device, the host, yes, the host, basically sends a one. Now, if the one wire device is trying to send back a one bit to the host, it just lets the line float up to the high level. When the host samples the line a few microseconds later, it's going to read a one. Easy. But if the one wire device wants to send back a zero bit, as soon as it sees the I.O. line fall, it begins pulling it low too. I mean, the open drain bus doesn't care. 
When the master samples the I.O. line, the one-wire device is still pulling the line low even though the master released it. The master samples a zero bit and the one-wire device can release the line and let it float high again. To start a transaction, the host holds the I.O. line down for between 480 and 640 microseconds. That's called a reset pulse, and it's how the host gets the attention of all the one-wire devices on the bus. When any one-wire device sees a reset pulse, it answers by driving the I.O. line low for between 60 and 240 microseconds. That's called the presence detect pulse. And when the host sees the presence detect pulse, it knows that at least one device is online and ready to accept a command. You can think of the reset pulse as the host asking, is anyone out there? And the presence detect pulse as the one wire devices reply, I'm here and I'm ready for a command. And the first command after a reset sequence is always interpreted by the interface and control logic. Now here's why. Frequently, a system will contain just a single one-wire device. Yes, the device has a unique ROM ID, and yes, the device can be addressed using that ROM ID. But if there's just one device in the system, why address the device at all? Just issue a skip ROM command, and you'll get right to talking to whatever system level functions you need to access. Alternately, if you want to read the unique ROM ID, you can issue a read ROM command, and the one wire device will transmit its internal 64 bit ROM ID onto the bus. But if your system has multiple one wire devices on a single bus, well, you'll need to specify which device you want to talk to so they don't all respond at once. You do that with the match ROM command. Send that command followed by the ROM ID of the device. Then the next device level command will be interpreted and executed by only that device. Now there's another command, resume ROM, and that directs device level commands to the most recently addressed device. And to discover the ROM IDs of the devices in your system, you can use the search ROM command. And you'll see these called ROM level commands in the OneWire documentation. So, what kind of devices support OneWire technology? Well, the obvious application is a silicon serial number, and in fact, that was the first application for OneWire technology many years ago. Next comes non-volatile memory, and Maxim makes a, a variety of memory devices that support OneWire. But Maxim also builds OneWire authenticators, OneWire temperature sensors, OneWire high-voltage I.O. ports, OneWire temperature loggers, OneWire interfaces to other serial buses like I2C, OneWire battery monitors and protectors. <laughs> the applications are practically endless. And it's those applications that we're going to talk about in the next episode. Don't miss it. We'll see you then.